Hello, and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOFT webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOFT webinar series features speakers from the International Conference on Software Engineering, as well as selected keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I am Will Trace, most recent chairman of ACM SIGSOFT, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide before you, mostly for the people joining us for the first time today. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and on the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems, which some of you may, with the slides or audio, please press the F5 key in Windows, Command R on the Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices, or you can simply close and relaunch the presentation. Obviously, the control volume adjusts the master volume on your computer. If you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please type them into the Q&A box at any time, and I'll do my best to uh, organize them and present them at the end of the uh, session. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Risky File Management by Audrey Moskos. And uh, in way of introduction, Audrey works for AT&T, then uh, worked for AT&T, then Lucent Bell Labs and Avaya Labs for 21 years. Now he is the Erickson Harlan D. Mills Chair Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science of the University of Tennessee, where he specializes in the recovery, documentation, and analysis of digital remains left as traces of collective and individual activity. His work has improved the understanding of how teams of software engineers interact and how to measure their productivity. Ardras, without further ado, please take it away. Hello, I'm Ardras Motzka. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, and I'd like to start by sort of summarizing the overall talk in a very short paragraph. Um, basically, uh, this is a practical, very practical experience uh, that uh, summarizes the common issue in uh, commercial software. And uh, that common issue is that uh, uh, much of the commercial code base, for various reasons, is fairly large, but actually that's being used in business by customers. It's typically a very tiny percentage of that uh, entire code base. And the companies uh, that uh, try to sort of spend quality improvement efforts uh, in the, by improving the, the quality of their software um, don't really need to uh, spend an uh, immense amount of effort of actually trying to uh, deal with the entire code base. Typically, all you need to do is to really look at less than 1% of the entire code base in order to have a very significant effect. So this work uh, has been done over uh, a number of years, uh, and uh, um, it, it is a result of various, uh, uh, various techniques that I've developed over uh, more than 20 years of working in, uh, in software industry. Um, and the particular uh, presentation that focuses on experiences uh, based on analyzing uh, 43 fairly large projects that, uh, uh, that we're able to successfully improve their quality. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's uh, look at the motivation for this work. Uh, what are the instances, what are the situations where uh, it is uh, reasonable or actually expedient to use the, the approach that I'll describe? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, one of the critical parts uh, software is that it's not particularly transparent for anyone except the person or developer who is actually making uh, and fixing a bug perhaps in a specific location of it. 
Uh, but uh, larger software systems need some management expertise whereby uh, uh, some resources are devoted to quality improvements efforts. And uh, it's very difficult uh, for uh, the entire uh, set of stakeholders, you know, from individual developers who are fixing bugs in the really bad part of the code to managers to kind of see the problem in the same way. And I think uh, this approach helps uh, organizations achieve that. So the specific examples where uh, risky file analysis would be particularly helpful that we found is where knowledge has been lost. And there's a variety of reasons why knowledge could be lost. Typically, uh, that happens when a company acquires another company and uh, uh, some of the developers perhaps of the original company cash out and, and leave. Um, there could be instances where a uh, product has a very long development history and perhaps the original developers have retired already. Um, uh, there could be instances uh, of offshoring, outsourcing uh, when the product is transferred between the development teams. Another set of uh, 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 factors is, uh, is related to quality. That is, you know, you really want to improve the quality of the product. It could be because the product, because of any of the reasons mentioned above, is no longer satisfying quality uh, uh, requirements of the users. Uh, product may have a very large customer base, so any kind of problem that customers observe is very difficult to deal because you have thousands of people affected that complain and you need to deal with these complaints. And uh, another uh, uh, instance could be that it's a component that's used by a number of different projects in, in your company or elsewhere. Or, or, as I mentioned, is a recently acquired product and you want to sort of understand uh, a little bit about what are their weak, weak spots within that product and what uh, needs to be done. So, um, so the main benefits are uh, uh, basically that, uh, that effort is spent on really where it needs to be spent for quality improvement. And we looked at a very large number of projects and we couldn't find instance where, um, where we would have uh, um, um, overwhelming uh, percentage of issues that are reported by end users not to be within 1% uh, of the most, uh, uh, most risky code base. So this is, this is a very important uh, uh, point, and uh, there are various reasons why that happens in commercial software, typically, uh, these reasons are uh, is requirements to have various features, various ability to uh, work uh, backward compatibility features, uh, ability to work with different protocols, different kinds of hardware, software, uh, and many of these things are there. Uh, it cannot be removed uh, from the software because you know customers bought these features. Whether or not they're using, that's their problem. Uh, the provider of uh, software is, is not at liberty to say, well, look, we, we sort of decided that you, even though you have a license for this, we really can't support 90% of the code, so we're removing all these features. That's really not realistic. But in, in practice, uh, users actually don't use uh, uh, most of this stuff. And, uh, and for the stuff that's being used, it's typically a very small part. So the first benefit is that this approach allows uh, to expose the areas that are actually uh, relevant for quality to different types of uh, stakeholders. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, um, uh, and these could be either uh, used to uh, rebuild loss expertise or perhaps do some quality improvement efforts. Uh, second part uh, is that it allows the organization to understand a little bit better of what their product is. Uh, because uh, once you go through this approach, you have some idea of where defects will happen in the future. Therefore, some, uh, schedu uh, some scheduling of effort could be done. Uh, another approach that we found beneficial is oftentimes developers have a very good idea of what parts of the code need to be fixed. However, uh, it's often not very easy for them to articulate uh, that to the management, especially if the management has a as a focus on implementing new features as opposed to improving quality of the product. Um, 
And uh, uh, and this uh, so this this approach allows sort of quantitative evidence so that uh, uh, subject matter expert SMEs can sort of work together with management and project management to uh, to to take cost effective actions to avoid uh, to improve our customer experiences. And we've seen uh, we've seen a number of examples, and I'll talk about them of projects actually improving quality, improving understanding of their product, improving over, oversight of how the changes are made, as well as actually some projects taking action and implementing um, fixes. So let's uh, outline the approach. Again, it consists of collecting the data, linking various data sources. And again, these data sources would be fairly common for any, for any software project. Once that's done, uh, trying to understand where the risk comes from, so there's a little bit of modeling involved. Uh, one interesting point is that this kind of data analysis is really a very, very tiny part of the entire uh, um, procedure because uh, just know, uh, just having some quantitative evidence where uh, risk is, is not enough to really uh, reduce it or address it. And so, um, so we found out that, uh, that in practice, every type of stakeholder needs a very detailed information to sort of decide what action to take, as well as implementing these actions. And so that's kind of the prioritization part. And finally, of course, once the actions are determined, uh, are scheduled, uh, put into the plan, then of course monitoring and quality improvement would be the next step. So data sources, again, uh, uh, most companies uh, use some sort of version control system, and if they don't, they should. Um, these days, Git is a very popular one, but since we sort of work with a lot of legacy projects, uh, there, was, there were other systems like Subversion, ClearCase, that were also widely used. And the first part is, is create sort of data warehouse where information from code changes is collected. Second part, of course, code changes by themselves are not particularly useful because we want to understand uh, which code changes were associated with bugs, in particular bugs that came from uh, end users. And uh, uh, modification requests or MRs, uh, issues sometimes uh, they're called in JIRA, uh, are, are, uh, are a source of that. In, in this particular company, uh, was a pretty good strategy, uh, good structure in terms of code uh, could not be committed without specifying a modification request. So that link was present in, in other situations that might be a challenge to establish that. Obviously, whatever happens is development is not, uh, does not concern end users. So we need to, to find out which issues, which MRs, which code changes are actually pertaining from, uh, uh, from customer found defects. And for that, we need customer support systems. In this case, Siebel, it's a widely used system that many companies uh, use that. Obviously, um, as I mentioned later, uh, experience is, is an important part that, uh, uh, in, in understanding who the developers are. Uh, one needs access to corporate directory. In this case, uh, we have used post and active directory. Linking the data, as I briefly mentioned, we need to go from code changes to modification requests to customer found defects through the kind of tracing the links from commits to MRs to, uh, um, to Siebel. Uh, then we need to sort of uh, extract uh, handles uh, of developers from commits to sort of uh, uh, obtain their organizational affiliation in order to uh, uh, calculate the experience on different things. Finally, it's one of the kind of interesting points that I want to illustrate on the, uh, on the next slide, and that is the concept of related files. Uh, one kind of always, as a developer, knows which branch uh, they're working and where to put patches in. However, if we take uh, uh, multiple developers, especially multiple projects, especially uh, version control systems like Git that sort of justify and encourage uh, a lot of branching. Um, it is not super clear uh, what is the concept of a file, uh, which files actually are uh, the same things that are modified, especially in different repositories 
that do not have an explicit uh, uh, branching separation. So this illustrates sort of, for example, we have one uh, project that uses uh, uh, clear, clear uh, project clear that perhaps uses clear case and, and project light that uses maybe Git. And we have a tree, version tree of IO.C in project light and version tree of FIO.C in, uh, in project clear. Now, uh, each version control system keeps track of versions of these files. But if we extract that information and put it in the database, we can detect that actually version two of FIO.C is identical, is exactly the same file, uh, same string as version v.1 of io.c. So if these things happen, we essentially link these two version histories into a single one and collect the information uh, for both of them. And we found that kind of approach to really work quite well in uh, heavily branched code. Uh, this is slide uh, just gives an overview of various pieces of information that need to be collected into this warehouse. And I won't go into the details, but I just wanted to give you some idea that there's quite a bit of stuff that needs to be collected in order to be able to do this analysis. So uh, once the data is collected, uh, the next step is sort of understand where these defects actually happen. And as I mentioned, these defects uh, reported by customers happen typically in very small percentage of the code base. Um, one can just simply look at the areas that uh, files that actually experience CFDs, and these probably will occupy uh, perhaps only 1% of the code base. But one can actually do a little bit better and try to predict where the future defects will happen. So, so these are the, the, the slide lists the number of uh, predictors that might, uh, uh, that have been shown to be uh, useful in predicting customer found defects. Now, what we found is that we don't really need that many of them. We actually need only three that are uh, in bold, number of past changes, number of past customer reported defects, and number of developers who left to really capture uh, basically the, the quite precise, accurate, to obtain an accurate predictor of where the customer defects will happen. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned, is that typically these are the files where the traditional functionality that's used by the most users is, 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 is developed. And therefore, um, um, the, the fact that there were defects in the past means simply that there probably be defects in the future. And of course, the number of developers who left the intuition behind that is that perhaps now we don't have real experts on that area uh, that know the design, original design decisions and whenever they fix bugs or add functionality, they may more likely to make mistakes. So once we sort of identify these predictors that actually affect future defects, we can fit a logistic regression model or some other model that will for the uh, values of each uh, file uh, obtain the risk of the, the file having defects, and then we sort essentially all the source code in the in the project by that uh, by that risk. So this really uh, kind of would seem like would end uh, all the effort, but unfortunately, uh, just getting information about what's problematic is not enough. We really need to inform people who take action about that, that. And so the next set of slides sort of describes the second part and probably even more important part of the project, which is process, uh, which is to actually inform relevant experts about what to do. So, um, so we sort of, uh, as we work through various ways of, of getting traction, we realize that there are different types of um, stakeholders uh, and, of course, the most important one is subject matter experts, is people who actually work and make changes to the code. So these are developers, architects, uh, senior developers, somebody who actually is, uh, understands the particular part of the code. The other set of experts are people that are managing them, and so they need to get some overview of what's more important than, than other pieces, and perhaps some others are uh, even higher level managers or perhaps project managers that need to schedule things and so they need 
uh, yet another representation like a, a spreadsheet, uh, which, which typically is necessary for them. Now, uh, providing information is, of course, not enough. We found that we also need to provide some uh, uh, suggestions on how that information should be used, and I'll give some examples a little bit later. But let's first show some of the uh, visuals that are being presented. So this is kind of the real, actual web-based uh, uh, view of the, of the tool itself. So there's about 1,000 1, projects that one can select, which you have released and variety of other things uh, that are, are shown. Uh, again, I won't go into the detail. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give some, some idea of, of how the, uh, that there's a variety of other information that might be, might be helpful uh, uh, for, uh, for project managers, perhaps, uh, or for quality experts within the company. Um, if we, uh, so the next slide shows, um, so it's the view that actual um, uh, person, a uh, subject matter expert who selects their project uh, can see. And again, the file names have been obscured for privacy reason. Uh, but uh, basically, we have a table. So it's an HTML table. And we have a file in the left column, uh, related files in the middle column, uh, MRs, uh, and so forth, uh, uh, further down uh, uh, to the right. So this view basically says, here are the top two files for this project. Give some statistics about these files, you know, how many changes these files have, how many authors. In this case, the top file has about 70% of the authors who actually are no longer with the company. Uh, the next one has, uh, uh, has a little bit better, uh, better situation with only 25% uh, of the one, uh, people who left related files allows you to kind of see uh, the, the files perhaps in the different branches of the same project or in other projects where, uh, um, where the same code resides. And then what we found is for subject matter experts, they needed not just the file, but the history of the file. In the particular, they really needed to know what are the customer found defects associated uh, with that specific file. Um, and, and, and therefore, we sort of present a couple of uh, uh, latest uh, CFDs and as well as a link to full list of CFDs. And further down, we, can, uh, we have a link to full list of authors who made modifications to the file, as well as full list of MRs. And again, these were requirements that uh, subject matter experts uh, asked us to include uh, because it helped them to sort of decide, get in context, understand what the situation with these particular files was. Uh, the next view uh, shows related files. So again, you can select a particular file, and it shows uh, uh, a list of other files in other projects, perhaps, uh, or in the same project that, uh, that have been copied and, and perhaps developed independently. Um, so one of the important reasons for that is that we can uh, uh, see uh, fixes, perhaps, uh, to customer found defects in other products uh, that rely on the same code, and these may be actually uh, helpful and need to be patched in into the existing product. Um, and uh, uh, we found that actually uh, most of the files have uh, numerous related files, and that this feature was, uh, was quite useful. Um, interestingly, though, it was, uh, we had sort of two views on that feature. One view was that well, even if we use this, this code in our project, our use cases are so different, we don't really care if some other project fix CFDs because we don't expect uh, to have the same problem. So that was kind of one extreme view, which we're surprised. Well, other view was more in line with our expectations, uh, which basically says, well, um, we actually would like to include fixes from other projects in, into our project. In, the context in which it was done was actually, um, in particular, one of the quality improvement efforts was removing uh, static analysis bugs, and, uh, um, and there was uh, measurement based on that. And so the project said, well, look, if somebody else uh, went into trouble to sort of uh, address some of the static analysis bugs, I, I would like to actually incorporate that, uh, that these patches into, into my system. So so I don't have to really spend that time and, and yet get this kind of uh, um, improvement that, uh, that, um, that 
you know, could get me promoted and so forth. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I won't go over the details of this slide, but just wanted to give you some idea, is that just giving the information and providing this interface to developers wasn't really enough for them to make the decision. So we really had to go through uh, 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 a number of cases uh, with, uh, with developers to sort of understand exactly how they make uh, the decisions and sort of condense that in, uh, into sort of a reporting template, that is how, what to look for if there's no, uh, for example, if there's no, um, uh, if there's a lot of knowledge lost, perhaps uh, we need to change uh, code inspection process so that people would be inspecting the files that with the most knowledge loss. If uh, um, in, in some cases, uh, maybe no action was required and so forth. Um, in some extreme cases, perhaps uh, uh, what was needed is actually the situation was so bad and the code so unmaintainable that perhaps it was actually even worth uh, going into the risky business of trying to sort of restructure the code uh, to make it more maintainable. Um, so one of the important things is that uh, um, that was uh, the sort of made the, uh, made this actually work is that uh, um, risky file management was a part of the quality process within the company. And so each project before release had to go through it and, uh, and actually fill a form like that, uh, like shown here, basically what, how many files are affected, what kind of action is needed, um, and, uh, uh, and so forth. Okay, so I talked uh, about the overall system. I also talked uh, about the uh, um, way of conveying information uh, to the stakeholders um, and training them as well on how to interpret that information. Again, uh, while these uh, sort of obtaining information and training people to use it is important, it's still not quite uh, does the job of actual risk remediation. So the next few slides talk a little bit about the experiences of uh, of actually uh, getting uh, uh, results uh, based on this approach. Um, so as anyone who probably worked within a company realized that, that, uh, that there are some uh, um, you know, important priorities that software projects have, and it isn't always quality uh, uh, that is at the top of the list because usually uh, time to market is very important in competitive environment. In other cases, maybe effort is, is limited. It's hard to hire the right people or to train them. Um, and so we sort of developed, uh, want to share some of the experiences on how best to really deploy a technique like that. Um, and of course, once of, one of the first things is that you want to sort of engage the project. Um, and uh, in order to engage the project, you need to understand what kind of project it is, whether or not it actually would benefit, as I mentioned in the beginning, from this kind of approach. And so one of the first questions is a new project or a mature project. For, for a mature project, obviously, there's a lot of information about past defects, about information about expertise. For a new project, it's going to be quite different. Um, one needs to uh, uh, look into and understand the way projects use version control system. For example, um, a lot of times uh, files like make files, uh, build files, uh, and files uh, are changed together with uh, files containing functionality. So you, if you sort of don't, um, don't sort of take that into account, uh, it might turn out that uh, you know make file is the most risky file within within the within the entire code base, which is obviously uh, not mean you know doesn't mean much because it's, the reason it's indicated as risky is simply because it was changed every time perhaps um, another file was changed uh, a file that that's fixing CFD was changed. And so uh, one needs to understand that the process in order to sort of filter the data in such a way that, uh, that the subject matter experts would feel comfortable with it. 
Um, so these are typically the, the sort of steps that we had to go through and then sort of uh, uh, after interaction or two, uh, develop custom filters for each specific project. Um, once that's done, um, then uh, we basically run the similar tools to determine file authorship because we need to determine who subject matter experts are. And we found that people who actually made a lot of changes to these critical files uh, tended without, uh, uh, without exception to be the people that you know, everybody uh, within the development team agreed uh, are the right uh, subject matter experts. Um, uh, once we sort of have these SMEs that, uh, that we sort of reach out and, and suggest to the project, uh, obviously some of them perhaps are on critical projects, uh, critical tasks, and, and managers sometimes, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a ability to select uh, a specific SME that perhaps is not uh, super busy on some critical task uh, for us to train and work on this, uh, on this process. So once the SMEs are sort of selected, uh, and finalized and vetted by the managers, uh, they examine uh, the report that we provided and uh, determine action for each risky file. And the next step would be to actually schedule that action and put that into project plans. So let's uh, go over some of these actions and some, some are pretty, uh, very, pretty basic actions. Uh, for example, um, in project G, um, most common action was that nothing needs to be done. Um, it could happen for a variety of reasons. For example, it could be a risky file, but perhaps uh, the functionality has been moved somewhere else, and that file will not be used in future re uh, uh, releases. Another option, it could be that the, the file is automatically generated. So it could be a file that's modified uh, because uh, it's uh, it's you know, it uses some, it's not really, even though it's a source code file that we look, it may be generated from a bunch of other source code files based uh, during the build. And as a result, every time uh, a, a, a customer found defect is fixed, uh, that file is also changed, but it's changed not because, uh, not directly, but some other file that is uh, uh, triggering its change is has the CAD implemented. Um, Another reason for no action required is that uh, um, that uh, perhaps that's a functionality that's not going to experience much uh, in terms of uh, evolution, uh, uh, or it might not be a very critical functionality. And in these cases, typically the action is that uh, uh, is to sort of ensure that the the, the code uh, uh, test reviews are done that perhaps the people who are involved in these reviews have sufficient expertise to make judgments. Um, other, uh, uh, other suggestions included increasing test automation for these areas, uh, especially since the area is not, plan uh, not uh, uh, evolving very fast. Obviously, uh, increasing the regression test coverage of that would be uh, beneficial. Um, for certain cases, uh, um, uh, instead of actually making any changes to the code, uh, decision was to make uh, add additional design test guidance. So basically, for these files to provide additional uh, um, guidance explaining what other, what kind of design decisions to make, how to fix uh, issues, how to write test cases, so that um, that the um, that the end users are not going to experience defects in the future. So these are um, these are additional control. Uh, actions if, uh, if uh, for stable parts of the code, uh, stable yet uh, uh, important parts of the code. Now, in cases, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, critical parts of the code where major new functionality is being added. And in these cases, project decided to, to basically kind of re-implement uh, re a significant portion of that core functionality with the hope that perhaps re-implementation would would have uh, would be easier to maintain and perhaps have a higher quality. Uh, in some cases, uh, when the file perhaps isn't very critical, uh, yet there's no longer any uh, any any author who's authored that file, 
uh, assigning file ownership was uh, uh, was uh, was uh, an action that was uh, suggested in this project G. So uh, obviously, once these things are done, and I, as I briefly mentioned, these these are done as uh, as a part of the release uh, strategy uh, as part one of the quality gates for release to come out. Um, Typically, these actions, for the most part, uh, have uh, to be scheduled uh, for the next release unless there's some uh, real sense of urgency. Um, and, uh, and then uh, for many products, we went through multiple releases. And so we had some feedbacks from a number of uh, projects about how they implement their actions and uh, what, was, what worked and what did not work. Um, and this, uh, uh, this was communicated back to certain projects as well as, uh, uh, as being, uh, uh, you know, disseminated uh, uh, throughout the company. So um, I just wanted to give you some idea of uh, what was sort of uh, deployment status at that time. Uh, so, um, so these 43 projects actually generated uh, candidate file lists. Uh, and uh, uh, for which we generated uh, uh, and filtered candidate file lists. So these were engagement went through sort of first two iterations. Um, and then 26 projects had uh, uh, some discussions about that. And then on the right, I sort of uh, obscured the actual list of projects. And then, uh, uh, and then there's uh, 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 projects that, uh, um, that provided the uh, uh, feedback for for the implementation. And some of these feedback was that they really wanted to see the actual code. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we included. They wanted to see actual modification requests that were related to these files, as well as people uh, that were involved in, in authoring these files. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, multiple forms of presentation for different stakeholders was critical because, again, uh, um, managers prefer the the kind of uh, Excel-like format, while, while developers prefer a more kind of direct uh, uh, drill-down approach that I showed. Um, what we also found is that uh, aggregation was very much uh, role-specific. So developers really didn't want to look at anything above the file functionality. Actually, they would have preferred to look perhaps even at the lower, like, functional level functionality. While managers weren't really uh, that keen on, on looking at individual files, they were more sort of interested in, in seeing what modules, what, uh, what sort of groups of functionalities were uh, important. And so, uh, so one, of the, one of the things we did is we, we provided these uh, different types of aggregation where uh, different stakeholders could kind of get the, you know, either a very detailed view or perhaps a bird's eye view of, of what's going on. Um, so nine, uh, nine projects uh, were actually uh, not only determined what actions uh, they, they, they need to take, but actually were taking them for were deploying similar approach uh, that uh, the especially bigger projects, they already had uh, some sort of similar approach, but it's modified based on, on what we suggested. And uh, three that we're evaluating and about to take action. So um, uh, in, in some cases, Analysis was delayed to to the next release, um, and uh, and a few projects uh, uh, um, had uh, uh, considering evaluated as well. Uh, so one thing that I I didn't mention earlier is that it, even though there was required uh, uh, part of the quality gate process, it was up to the project to decide if they want to include that in their quality or not, and only the projects that were sort of uh, deemed to be particularly risky, we're forced to, to go undergo that, that process. So let me give you some sample actions or insights that were obtained. So for example, one of the pro first projects was Project A, and one of the issues it had is, a, is, is, is some serious quality issues that, uh, that, uh, that it uh, contained. And um, it was an acquired, as, as most other projects, it was then acquired from, from another company. 
And uh, uh, and they sort of, for number one thing, they, they sort of focused on refactoring and content control programs for the most risky files. Um, they sort of focused on, they sort of remove, uh, they removed the number of critical uh, 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 system defects and uh, and sort of uh, and uh, and sort of uh, deployed some tutorial to uh, to development team to sort of understand uh, uh, better what uh, what their code is. Uh, furthermore, they sort of took uh, took on uh, other quality improvement efforts. For example, they used Verity Static Analysis tool and sort of uh, uh, defined certain levels of uh, of and types of warnings that are allowed. Um, how many, uh, whether or not to uh, allow new defects to be reported, and and so forth. Um, so these uh, these were some of the pretty significant actions that were taken. Um, uh, Project B so identified 23 candidate top risky files, established refactoring program for two of the components, and actually tracked uh, uh, a tracked improvement plan with set of JIRAs. Um, and so forth. So these are some of the examples of uh, of the actions taken. Obviously, uh, uh, this is not the full. Uh, 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 there's many many things that could be done but haven't been done, and uh, especially these days, projects uh, create a very large number of branches, and some of them are developed in parallel. And, uh, and sort of uh, being able to uh, help projects understand what's relevant to their branch, especially if they feel that uh, type of the customers uh, for their project are different than customers for other projects and that they're uh, not likely to experience the same CFDs would be, of course, uh, helpful. Uh, one of the things that uh, we sort of at least initially worked on is, is project customization part is, is uh, one of the things that a lot of projects really demanded and we have not quite implemented that, is that uh, projects would prefer to actually make annotations themselves, so to extract the features they care from the files and, uh, and do prioritization based on their own uh, um, criteria and, uh, uh, and filter as well on uh, files that perhaps are not supposed to be risky and, and so forth. Um, so this customization approach um, obviously uh, would have been, uh, you know, would have allowed to deploy things on, on a much bigger scale. Um, there's kind of another extension is dealing with related files. And as I mentioned, related files are files that are typically developed in different projects in parallel. Oftentimes developers don't even know that uh, the same code is is used in in another project, and uh, obviously uh, leveraging that information for quality improvement would be extremely helpful. Uh, for example, allowing sort of interactive diffs, uh, allowing to see uh, immediately uh, CFDs fixed on other projects and so forth, uh, um, is something that uh, would be a very helpful extension. Uh, finally, um, um, developing some qualitative examples of, of how to sort of address uh, some of the risk profiles would be uh, would be would be a further further development that would be helpful. So I uh, went through the set of uh, my main set of slides. Um, not quite 50 minutes, uh, but uh, I would be uh, willing to spend a little bit more time on uh, on questions. Uh, um, and uh, I have several backup slides that I can use um, to illustrate the answers in case uh, such questions are there. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for your interesting and insightful presentation. I will commend you on the analysis, which I thought was very uh, thoughtful uh, and uh, based on real the real world. So with that, I've got a couple questions here, and I will ask uh, the attendees to please continue to submit. So the first question, back up to 
uh, earlier part in, uh, portion of your presentation. Could you elaborate on top 1% of all files contribute to 60% of uh, the fielded defects? I, uh, I'm just finding that slide. Push the audience. Uh, not quite. Yeah, I think that's the one. Yes, so um, so when I mean field defects, I have in mind uh, defects that are reported by end users of the software, customers typically for commercial software. And, uh, and uh, invariably in all the projects we looked, we basically did a tracing. Uh, so whenever the customer reports an issue that ends up being uh, on on developers table essentially requires a change and modification to the code. Um, that issue is typically, well, many organizations track them very carefully because obviously uh, it requires communication between customer support and development teams and uh, obviously affects customer satisfaction and various other things. So if we really look at the defects that are actually come all the way from the end users and end up being fixed in the code base, we find that invariably tiny portion of code base contain all these fixes. These, these fixes are not uniformly distributed over the code base, but they're really highly concentrated. And in many projects, actually 1% of the code base contributes to 100% of the customer reported defects. But obviously in some, uh, in some projects we could see uh, that uh, that 1% of, of files uh, contain fixes to uh, you know uh, as low as 60% of the of the problems reported. In this. Thank you. Okay, the next question is: Did you find different risk factors are more strongly correlated in different projects? Uh, that is a great question. Um, so let me try to go to the right slide. So uh, as I mentioned uh, um, in, uh, in some, uh, some of the slides, one of the important things uh, to, for this approach is to determine if it's suitable. So um, in, uh, uh, in most cases, uh, the approach is more suitable for older projects, especially the projects that have been either acquired from another company or the projects were, or that are old enough where actually uh, people are retired or maybe moved on, uh, you know, they, they've been developed over a period of time. In other projects, perhaps very new projects, um, and we had a number of these, uh, there is actually no history of customer found defects because the project actually has not been deployed uh, to end users yet. Um, so obviously in that case, we would have zero customer found defects, uh, yet these projects still would like to sort of understand where it should focus their, uh, um, their quality improvements efforts. It's obviously a difficult problem to answer because uh, one has, as even in a new project, one has a bunch of functionality that perhaps most users would not find, uh, not, would not actually exercise, uh, and then a lot of functionality that, uh, uh, some functionality that all users will exercise, and, and it's the part that, you know, most users will exercise that will uh, create these defects. So, um, so this, uh, so in this case, we, um, we basically utilize the information uh, that's obtained from also historic, uh, 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 historic data saying, well, if we don't have CFDs, then we can sort of look at the number of past changes, number of software ver verification MRs, and of course, for new projects, uh, nobody has left, so that, that variable will not be important. But, uh, uh, but SVMRs and amount of changes would be uh, then kind of the, uh, the basic predictor. Now, I should add one more thing, is as long as technology is the same for a new project as for the existing project, we can still measure the author experiences uh, based on uh, other projects they've been working on within the company. And so, uh, so author experience can still be used as the, 
as as one of the predictors. And uh, um, and so yes, in uh, um, in the projects that do not have much much in terms of uh, uh, customer reported defect history, one has to rely on on software verification defects. Uh, or author experience, as well as the amount of uh, change that went into the code to sort of identify potential future CFDs. While for the uh, for the uh, projects where uh, some history is available, uh, typically uh, looking directly at where CFDs occur would be uh, typically is the kind of the primary predictor of future CFDs. Good. Good. Okay, the next question, is there any variation on the programming language analyzed and what languages did you cover? Um, great question. So um, the projects I mentioned, there's about 1,000 projects uh, for which 46 we prepared the data. Uh, the projects ranged in programming language from C, C++, Java, um, uh, some user interface in JavaScript. There were some mobile uh, applications, uh, you know, obviously written both in Java and C++, some server applications as well. Um, so there's a, there was a variety of different, uh, um, different uh, some web applications as well. So there's a variety of different, um, different types of, uh, different types of uh, uh, applications. Um, now, so given that, what are other like specific languages that are perhaps more uh, more likely to experience CFDs than other languages? And obviously, many of the projects use multiple languages. For example, in cases where the efficiency is important, like uh, in mobile software or in server software, a lot of stuff is implemented in C++. While perhaps for user interfaces, Java or JavaScript are the appropriate solutions. So, um, so this leads to uh, a question that I sort of did not mention too much, but I think it's an important question: is that customer found defects could be of different uh, severities, and what we sort of looked for is customer provided defects, uh, reported defects that were fixed a and b. They had a severity of at least two because you can obviously imagine a user interface, not just imagine, but in fact, if you look at defects, user interface parts typically have a lot of uh, customer reported problems, but these tend not to be problems that really affect the uh, experience, user experiences as much as the problems where perhaps application crashes or goes down. So, um, so uh, as far as languages are concerned, uh, we really did not, so uh, uh, the main languages, as I mentioned, were Java, C, and C++. Uh, we really did not see uh, a significant difference among languages, but we did see a substantial difference among different types of functionality in terms of kind of uh, uh, the number of CFDs reported. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one thing that I, I want to reiterate we really excluded these kind of cosmetic or uh, or uh, severity three and four CFDs from consideration. So we're really only focusing on serious issues here. And as far as serious issues are concerned, they uh, they sort of occurred um, in various functionalities without necessarily being uh, higher in one and lower in another, or uh, one particular language uh, being uh, worse than another specific language in this particular set of projects that we looked at. Thank you. Okay, a uh, couple of more detailed questions. How often is the case for issues to be actually linked to commits in the version control system? Uh, so very good question. So uh, if one looks at uh, open source projects, it is very common that there isn't really very good tracking uh, there. Now, in this particular company that we look, there was really a requirement that you cannot uh, make a commit without specifying issue. That said, obviously, um, you can specify a bogus issue, can specify the wrong issue. Oftentimes, um, it was difficult, you know, for automation to really um, um, uh, to uh, identify that that perhaps the developer just uh, for expediency is not 
not including any any valid issue there. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, but these were uh, in the data. These were actually a minority of uh, of instances, and um, and most of the problems we usually had with recent acquisitions from other companies were perhaps uh, smaller startups that uh, uh, that did not have much in terms of discipline, and uh, uh, and so there uh, there uh, we 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 had actually several projects where the uh, problem was so severe that we really could not really do the analysis simply because uh, uh, they have absolutely no relationship between, uh, between what customers reported and what, uh, uh, what actually was in the uh, uh, changes in the code. But, uh, uh, but for, uh, I would say for 90% of the projects, uh, the tracking was, uh, was actually very good or excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question. You mentioned training experts. Do you have specific ideas for the way these experts should be trained? Uh, great question. So what we um, uh, so there's two questions about experts. One a potential answer, and I don't know what was in my, uh, what was uh, there what was the question I had in mind. But one is how to train these subject matter experts, how to use the tool. But perhaps I think the question was about how to train experts to understand the source code. And for the second part, uh, for the second question, I can answer the first question if, if, uh, if it's uh, requested. But for the second question, I think the main idea here is that uh, um, the, the main training in software development occurs when somebody actually makes a change to the code or uh, inspects or reviews a change by another person. So our recommendation was that uh, if, uh, um, if their file had no longer any original authors, that somebody would be assigned. And whenever there is a change that needs to be made in that file, that particular person should actually make that change. And if they're not making the change and busy with something else, they should at least have someone else. Uh, they should review the change uh, made by someone else on that code. Um, so this is kind of the, kind of the main the primary approach um, that we sort of recommend in terms of training. That is, the training is actually, you know, making changes whether fixing bugs or adding features, and then, uh, uh, and then of course, reviewing uh, people, other people's changes uh, on, that, on that particular code. Um, one important thing is that obviously design in each part of the system might be quite different because many of these larger systems are developed by multiple authors. And so, uh, so training means actually understanding the design of that particular system, and there's no better way of, of doing that than, uh, than by actually uh, going and fixing bug in that, that specific area. Good. Now, uh, I'll, I'll combine a couple questions here. Uh, who else or where else is research in this area being conducted? If an individual is interested in following up uh, and understanding the scope, of uh, results and and in that line, what are your future plans or the challenges that you see? Uh, that's a that's a great topic. So what I wanted to share is really experience of deploying uh, uh, the um, the tool uh, the approach in in practice, uh, in highlighting uh, how many different layers you need uh, on top of sort of more quantitative research oriented part, which is you actually go and do the prediction. So there's quite a bit of work on defect prediction of various kinds, uh, and, uh, uh, and the literature is, is pretty rich in empirical software, and the software repository mining literature is rich in that. Uh, there's much less in terms of actually how these uh, uh, approaches uh, actually could be uh, implemented in practice so that some uh, uh, actual organization could use them. And I think uh, it would be interesting to uh, apply these both uh, to some of the open source projects, or maybe to uh, to some projects uh, within the uh, within the companies that uh, experience uh, either attrition of developers or are acquiring uh, smaller smaller other companies that want to do due diligence. Okay. Well, I see we're. Just about out of time, and 
I want to thank you again, Ardris, for this informative presentation and, again, the insightful answers. I appreciate having time for the questions that we had today. Uh, a special thanks again to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded and will be available online in a few days at HTTP, yes, uh, sixoff.org, resources, webinar.html. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org. Note that the slides include a short survey on this webinar. Uh, and if you have any topics you'd like to suggest or speakers you would like us to approach to include for future webinars, we'd like to hear that. On behalf of SIGSOFT, the speaker, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes 